Welcome to Women in Bioscience. Um, this is our third Women in Bioscience, although the first one that's not in person. Usually we do it at a fun location with fun snacks and drinks. So I hope you have your own snacks and drinks because the times, the difficult times are calling for it. Um, I wanted to welcome all of, I see Janet. I wanted to welcome all of our panelists today and I'll let them introduce themselves a little later. Um, and before we start, uh, a very important thing I wanted to Thank our sponsors today, IDEX, People's United Bank, and MTI for helping us uh, put together events like this. I should probably also um, introduce myself. My name is Agnieszka Carpenter, and I'm the Executive Director of BioMain. We're the organizer of this event. Um, before we start, I just wanted to go over a couple logistics for the event. Um, so we'll be going with this panel discussion up until about 3.55. And then at that point, I will put in chat um, a link to the next event or the next meeting, which is a more informal Q&A where we'll be able to see everybody and um, the audience members will be able to speak. Um, if you have any questions during this event uh, to any of the panelists, please put them in the Q&A. So you should be able to see Q&A on the bottom and the right. Um, and our moderator, Dr. Christy Townsend will be asking some of our questions and some of the audience questions. So in order for her to see those questions, she needs to look at the Q&A and she'll be able to see your questions. Um, we also have our chat function um, on, and this is for anybody um, to comment if you wish. We just ask that you're kind and respectful um, and nice in the chat. Um, this session is being recorded and it will be available later. So if you have any friends or colleagues who are missing this event today, they'll be able to watch it at a later time. Um, and before we start the um, panel discussion, I'd like to introduce a very special guest. Um, hi, Gemma. Uh, our special guest is Ijama Obi. She's the winner of this year's Main Biogenius Challenge. Um, and she also just participated in the uh, International Biogenius Final, that was a virtual event instead of um, being held in San Diego, but she got high honors and I wanted to recognize her. Congratulations, Ajoma, and wanted um, for Ajoma to say a couple words. Uh, thank you so much. Um, the opportunity to still be able to participate in BioMe despite everything that's going on with COVID was absolutely astounding. The judges gave amazing feedback. The questions were right to the point in terms of my project. And I really truly felt like I was moving on to a even greater competitive level uh, towards the international part of the fair. Overall, I was able to network with a bunch of wonderful students who, whose projects range from simple drug delivery all the way to how we can apply computers and AI into diagnosing diseases. And overall, it was a remarkable experience and I couldn't be happier for being able to have the opportunity, but at the same time, also being able to represent the great state of Maine. It was absolutely remarkable and being able to share my research through a virtual means was great. And overall, I'm just really happy and excited to have the opportunity and to reach where I was when I was in the competition. So thank you so much. Thanks, Ijoma. And you just um, graduated, right? Um, yeah, I just graduated Bangor High School on the 14th. So it's been about a week plus a few days, so. We actually just had a question for you, if you don't mind giving a quick um, overview to what your project was about. Um, so my project was mimicking um, the shape of cholesterol using an azobenzene molecule in order to hopefully improve drug delivery. Uh, so it's a bit of a pharmacology project of sorts because it really focuses on ion interactions and changing the shape of the molecule in order to change its functionality, so. And where are you headed next? Um, well, my game plan now is to head off to college and hopefully major in biomed engineering or chemical engineering. And I'll be heading to Columbia University this fall, the city of New York. <laughs> I saw um, Dr. Monty sort of just like, <laughs> 
Um, so I'll be heading there um, this fall, hopefully. Um, but I might have to do Zoom University for the first semester with everything going on. But also, I'm really excited, and I can't wait to be on campus. Thank you so much, Ijama, and congratulations again. We were so impressed with you, and I know you're going to have a bright future at, um, in, in front of you. Um, thank you. If you want, you can now um, turn off your camera, um, and we're going to move to our panel discussion, and I'd like to introduce Dr. Christy Townsend, our very own board member extraordinaire, who's going to be moderating this panel today. Hi everyone, thanks for joining us. There's no wine and cupcakes this year, but we're very happy to have you all with us and our great panelists as well. Um, so I'm a associate professor of neurobiology at University of Maine and I run a biomedical research lab um, and I'm excited to moderate the discussion today. So please continue to put questions into the Q&A box and I'll try to get to as many as I can. Uh, so we'll just go around the panelists and have everybody introduce themselves and uh, what they do and then we'll get going with some questions. Uh, Lauren, you wanna start us off? Oh, sure, Christy. So I'm Lauren Solano. I'm the co-founder of a company called Propel Careers. And we do a lot to help uh, students and young professionals find paths for them in the life sciences space. And so I'm excited to, to be here today to share some thoughts there. And then I do a lot of work with early stage entrepreneurial companies. So it's nice to be on both ends to be able to try to build the talent pipeline and try to help people make uh, really innovative discoveries. Great. Thank you, Megan. Hey, my name is Megan May. I'm a professor of infectious diseases at the University of New England at the medical school. Um, so I spend a little bit of time teaching infectious disease to first year medical students who then hopefully grow up to be Maine physicians, grow up, sorry, uh, graduate to become um, many of Maine's physicians. Um, and in the majority of my time, I run a research laboratory that's focused on of all things, emerging infectious diseases. So I don't sleep a lot right now, but I'm delighted to be here. Thanks so much for asking me, Christy. And we, are, we will allow a COVID <laughs> question or two to go to Megan today, and it doesn't have to just be career stuff. Uh, Janet? Hi, I'm Janet. Thank you all for being here today. I wish we could see all of you too, but maybe um, in the latter part of this. I'm currently the senior marketing manager for the testing group at Lanza. Lanza is a large biotech company based in Switzerland, but we have lots of facilities all over. There's a Lanza facility in Rockland, Maine. There's one in Portsmouth. I'm actually based at the facility in Maryland because that's where our testing products are made. So we make uh, products that test pharmaceuticals for endotoxin contamination. It's a required test that helps guarantee the safety of our pharmaceutical products. I, this is my first uh, job in a large corporate, very large corporate environment. Uh, pro, you know, I came to Maine right out of my postdoc. I have PhD in biochemistry and molecular biology, studying protein and nucleic acid interactions. Came to Maine to work at IDEX as a research scientist and then made some decisions about wanting to stay in Maine and stay in biotech. So I ran the Maine Technology Institute. I was the founding president there when that organization was established with the goal of, um, you know, the goal is to create jobs and create companies in Maine. And I thought I'll help create companies and I'll go work for one of them. That actually worked. And I did then join the startup world and I managed or participated in at various levels a series of startups and um, through that and through connections eventually actually admitted that I was really doing marketing and not science and um, the last few years have been focused on marketing and, and moved into Lanza from some of the people that I met and my other experiences. So I look forward to talking with you all. I'm enjoying the marketing position that I have now and uh, look forward to hearing from all the other panelists as well. Thank you. Thank you. And Jen? Hi there. Uh, my name is Jen Monty. I'm a cardiologist at Maine Med and um, came to Portland from the University of Pennsylvania primarily because I saw this place as a real rocket ship for clinical people to 
work out ways to solve the problems we see every day. In other words, there was so much clinical expertise and we really had no pathway for building products and services to solve our problems and then maybe start companies out of that. So the group I run here is called the Innovation Cohort, which is now embedded in what is a very new sort of innovation center with really a radical focus on identifying problems that come out of our organization that people want solved and taking them through sort of the early stages of figuring out if they're asking the right question, talking about things like product market fit, doing things like customer discovery. Those are not terms that physicians are accustomed to knowing, but they, physicians are very good at, not even physicians, people who work in the health system are very good at identifying the problems they need solved. And they come directly out of clinical work, and that's a really powerful position to be in to develop something useful. So we talk about three kind of goals of our group. One is that we invent with empathy. One is that everything we invest in is low cost and scalable. And the third is that you keep the patient and public health at the center of our mission. We are very much a startup within a huge organization, but it's tons of fun. I still spend about half, three quarters of my time seeing patients and doing imaging and a bunch of high tech tools. Uh, so happy to talk about any of these things. Great, thanks everyone. Uh, so now we're gonna have everybody give us a little bit more detail about how they got into the career that they're in right now and what inspired them um, to go into science and medicine fields. Um, so let's start again with Lauren. Oh, you're muted, I think. I can't see how to. Sorry, sorry about that. <laughs> uh, I'm, a, I'm a biochemistry molecular biology person by background and Probably like, like a lot of people here, you know, you think about research and there's so many ways to make an impact within that world. Um, but I, I ended up getting involved more on the business side with research heavy institutions initially. So the first, I guess, 10 years of my life was spent more in preclinical drug discovery, drug development. So that foundation of science, super helpful, which said it like, as, as a few of you mentioned, is, is a launching pad in terms of then, you know, how do you make an impact on a larger scale and really help to get technologies uh, together. But fundament fundamentally, I guess what drove me was I, I like helping people. I like being a part of trying to solve problems. I like being a part of making a difference. And so that's what drew me into the life sciences space. And then I've had opportunities to be able to grow and evolve over time. And now I have the pleasure of helping others now chart their course. And so it feels really good to be able to give back and get people in a direction where they can follow their passions. Great, right, and Megan? So this is going to sound ridiculous, but it's true. I wanted to be Indiana Jones when I grew up. I kid you not that the, I always wanted to be a college professor. I really did. And I loved the idea of going all over the world and learning things that hadn't been discovered yet. And that just seemed like the world's coolest job to me. And so I always had that in my, in my head. And in terms of why do I study you know, what I study? The other thing, this also kind of comes from, from um, sorry, my cat has joined the conversation. Uh, this, this also rather comes from um, being a kid and my, my mother was um, a, a pediatric NP with an MPH. And I remember taking one of her books in the early 80s that had just come out and reading it. And there was this brand new virus that no one had ever heard of before. And it was called, well, it wasn't called HIV at the time in the book because it had never been isolated yet. But this book talked about this new disease called AIDS. And that blew my mind. The idea that, wait, there are diseases that we don't know yet, and they can just appear out of nowhere, and then someone has to go figure out how to solve the problem. And I swear, between that and then reading The Hot Zone when I was 10 or something, that was what I always wanted to do. And I know that seems cartoonishly ridiculous, but it's 10,000% it's what happened. I did a few sidebars into maybe I'll be a professional musician and things like that. But really, that was that was always the thing for me. And we're glad that you did that because we need people <laughs> like you right now. Um, so Janet? 
Uh, sure. So I in, enjoyed science and math all through school. I came from a family where my parents um, didn't complete college. I think they had a little bit of college at the beginning. And so I didn't really know what a scientist did. So I thought I would probably be, I don't know, a medical technician. And then um, I did really well in school. So then I thought, oh, maybe I'll be pre-med. But I actually am really glad I did not choose that. Um, and I, what I learned in college, once I got to sort of doing independent research, was what being a scientist was. And so that experience really informed me. And one summer I volunteered when I came home, I think it was after my sophomore year in college, and I volunteered at a cancer lab at a local hospital. And a woman, an older woman, ran the lab, managed the lab, and set me on my own little private project. And I, I went in there to wash dishes. I, I was washing dishes. And then she let me do some tissue culture. And I was testing different chemotherapeutic drugs on mouse tumor cells and looking at impacts on different mouse tumor cells. And you know, for the first time, realized that it wasn't like a lab in a class where you have a protocol that you follow and a result that you're supposed to get, because I would never get the right results in my science classes. So lab always kind of bothered me. <laughs> but um, I had that experience and realized what doing real research was and really liked that. So when I got back to my college at Wake Forest, you know, I really pursued that. I did independent research during college and then went straight to graduate school and was happy with that. And then since that time, I've made several career switches, but I always depend on my scientific background. I continue to be interested in science and I've stayed within mostly the biotech arena and you know continue to use that knowledge and learn new knowledge. And that's the part of the scientific process I really have enjoyed, continue to enjoy, and continue to like. I mean, I'm learning new things all the time. I didn't know anything about endotoxin testing when I started my job at Lanza, and now I'm managing the entire group that's selling this product into the industry. So I know a little bit about it. They actually know a lot more than I do. But um, you know, continuing to learn every single day, and I really enjoy that about careers in science, even though it's marketing which I thought was the dark side, but I, I'm okay with it now. <laughs> and Jen? I, um, I had a unique experience in that I came into being a doctor thinking that doctors didn't really know what they were doing. And that was based on this really personal experience I had when I was 15, where my sister died suddenly a week after she had been sick. So when that happens, you say, oh, okay. I really needed to know why that happened, right? So I ended up on a 10-year journey to become a physician, really to fill in the blanks of that story. And I think you find a lot of physicians with some angle like that. So for me, I came into it thinking, not that doctors were great, but actually that doctors were failing all the time. So I thought it was the duty of physicians to do science and take care of patients. So my path, um, coming out of that was I did an undergraduate degree in biochemistry and then I took three years um, and lived and worked in the Bay Area. And this was in like the mid 2000s where I worked for a group that did things like value early stage companies. What does that even mean? It means know enough of the science to be conversant and really ask good questions and figure out what problem they're really trying to solve and what's worth investing in. That's fun. And then I had the experience of going to a meeting at the Cleveland Clinic and I said, this is what it's like to be a doctor. So my, I went to medical school at Case Western Reserve and spent 90% of my time at the Cleveland Clinic. So I was really steeped in the notion that the duty of a physician is to invent and collaborate with science and do it well. And then I was, went from there to pretty academic organizations, but quickly came to the realization that that's mostly not what doctors do. So there's this great friction in the calling to be a physician because you really can operate in so many different domains. Um, and I think there's a couple of like minds on the phone call because I'll add that my, um, my seven-year-old's middle name is Indiana. So that's how much I wanted to be Indiana Jones. So it's that same sort of phenotype of creative person who's in a learning profession where I, I am never bored. And if I am, it's my own fault. Um, also, I think we've developed a group here that is starting to look at solving problems the only way I think they're solvable, which is at the intersection of entrepreneurship, public health, and medicine. Because for me, healthcare is on fire. Healthcare is a nightmare. I want to like apologize for myself daily. 
um, because I tell a lot of partial truths all day. So that's how I got to the job that I have now is how do you try to live at the intersection of those fields because the creative friction is really what gets you out of bed every day. Great. Um, I just want to remind all of our um, attendees that you can post questions in the Q&A. We only have one so far, so you have a very good chance that your question will be asked next. But I'll ask one more um, before we go to the Q&A box, which is uh, relevant to what we're all living through right now. Uh, so if the panelists can tell us a little bit about how their professional life has been affected by the pandemic, and if they think, um, if they've been doing remote work, if they think that that's especially been uh, perceived differently or carried out differently uh, for men versus women. Anybody want to start us off on that question? All right, I'm going to start with you then, Janet, just to mix it up. Sure. Um, so I've worked remotely from home for a long time, pretty much since I left the state of Maine and Maine Technology Institute, um, off and on, been working from home. So the impact of working remotely did not change for me. What changed for me is that many of my team members are not used to working at home and the additional um, burden of having now kids or spouses and others at home that are not usually at home when I'm trying to work. <laughs> so um, that certainly was a big impact. The other impact for me and my job, which maybe is personal, is that all of a sudden the sales team was home not doing uh, customer visits. Normally they're on the road probably 90% of the time and they became very needy of marketing. <laughs> so a lot more meetings, a lot more presentations, but also a great opportunity for us to get some of the information that we don't normally get because we never have time to sort of generate the amount of marketing data, customer data, and things like that that we need to do. Now we have the added burden of managing projects that have been put on hold because the R&D labs have been closed down. The scientists have been working at home since March. The facility focused on only having a workers essential to the manufacturing business going in. So, um, you know, so my job, you know, didn't get easier, I guess it should, you know, continues to shift in the focus from, okay, all of a sudden focusing on, I have an opportunity to provide a lot more education and information to sales and other people who aren't usually around. Now we're looking at how do we reintroduce? What's our policy for field service engineers to address the customer? Um, and what's, you know, what should the policy be and how are we going to integrate R&D back and now participating in the conversations of all the reprioritization of all of our projects that need to happen because we've had a two and a half, well, it'll be three month delay in our R&D projects that feed into the products that we're developing that I then need to market. So certainly an impact both professionally and um, personally, and I will certainly say I don't have a young child, but I've dealt, you know, so I see my staff, my team really struggle with constant meetings. I'm on Zoom calls all day long and people feeling badly about having their kids in and out of the time, out of the frame and things like that. And it's, you know, some people have really had to struggle with that. I don't think there's a big difference. I haven't seen a big difference between men and women. In my team, I have, you know, men that are more involved with the childcare and women that are more involved with the childcare, but there's, it's definitely harder on people with young kids than it's been on people who don't have those young kids at home. Um, even if it's not, like, I don't perceive it as a bad thing, but they feel that it's not professional, you know, when they have their baby sitting there on their lap. And that's an adjustment that I think we've all had to make during this time. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, Lauren? I think um, I I'd love to share a few thoughts. Uh, I mean, certainly the work and life definitely blurs, right? Because you're kind of at your house just doing your thing. And so I think a lot of people probably have it's hard to, to break away from uh, from work, but I think I think more importantly for myself and for a lot of people that I've been trying to give advice to in terms of their careers, I think a lot of people are using this time to self reflect a lot more and really think about what are those key drivers that are important to me in my career. And for me, I like to think about these things as being anchors that then help drive. If you decide to, to make a move to a new opportunity. It, is it, you know, I want to be entrepreneurial or I want to work in cancer or I want to work in COVID or whatever it might be. But I think I, I've been seeing a lot of people really take time to think about 
how are they spending their time and how are they making an impact? And so I, I imagine post COVID, we may see a lot of people making moves career wise. So it aligns more with, with how they want to be impactful. So that, that could be a positive if we take time enough to think about these things. I think um, for, for me, it was a little bit of a twofold shift, right? In that much like everybody else, I suddenly am working at home and I suddenly have my sons at home trying to do school and they're 11 and, and six. And so the 11 year old, yeah, okay, sign on your Chromebook, blah, 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 but he needs help sometimes. The six year old, you're, all of a sudden I have to teach reading. I don't know how to teach reading to a six year old. Um, and so that was, that was shocking because there's that piece. And then at the same time, there's, I'm on a Zoom call and I'm trying to talk about clinical specimen handling for COVID patients because I'm a virologist who studies emerging diseases. And so I, there was this really, for me, this very intense pull in two directions in that, you know, I, I had, um, I had all of these professional requirements that became very intense. And uh, so not just from a research standpoint, but I like to do a lot of outreach. And so I was talking to reporters all the time. I was talking to, um, you know, our student health services, how are we going to do screening? How are we going to take good care of our students and protect them from getting sick? And if they do get sick, are we going to be able to test them on site? Is there going to be enough material for that? And up until a few weeks ago, that was still very much an open question. And so um, it, it was hard because on the one hand, I, I want to be in my lab doing things and solving problems, but the buildings are closed and I can't be there. And my son wants to know why I can't read to him right now. And my husband wants to know where the other son's favorite book is because no one in my house apparently can find anything except me. And so it's, there were, I, I felt very pulled in a lot of directions, but none of it was bad. It, it, it was, it's intense, but it's not bad. Um, don't know how else better to put that, frankly. Uh, that makes sense to me. <laughs> And Jen, have you been remote or maybe you can talk a little bit about what it's been like to be in healthcare right now? Yeah, I, a bit. Um, initially our office work was remote, but anytime I'm in the hospital, that's not remote. So the demands have been remarkable. Um, and what I want to emphasize as the, my kind of contribution here is don't underestimate the importance of things like Title IX and things like child care policy and their intimate relationship to women being successful at home. Um, that's the whole ballgame for, for people who choose to have children or choose to, you know, partner or marry. So I think this question when asked of women versus men, it's a little bit coded for what's the child care situation at your home. So that's how sort of, you know, local elections matter, right? I mean, everything matters, but the relationship to the conversation we have today, it's intimate to things like Title IX. Um, what I would say about how it's changed my job is we've just stood up a real innovation team here in the past few months. And we got more done in a few months than we would have gotten done in a few years. And that's because we took a SWAT team response and now are refo starting to refocus on the longer term. But we were able to do that. And uh, the piece of this that's gonna stick around and be a challenge for healthcare is the telehealth piece, right? So seeing patients remotely, it's kind of revealed what we've known for a long time is you don't need all these patients in for a visit. And most people don't, the arcana of healthcare billing is enough to like drive you to drink, but there are incentives to have people into the office versus see them remotely. Now, some of that policy change happened overnight and some of it will stick and some of it won't. But there are really discrete areas where it should stay and we're gonna offer better value and there is no way to care for a geographically distributed relatively poor population than to make it part of the core strategy and mission of an organization. So we have a window that opened. So I guess those are the points that I would, would kind of want to emphasize. Um, that women going to work 
in uh, families with children is still a political act, unfortunately. Megan? Can I, can I um, just add one thing on to that? And uh, we were having a discussion last week amongst um, some of the panelists. And one of the things that came out of this um, was that in as much as, you know, we have in, in my household an egalitarian philosophy about childcare, the children sometimes have their own ideas about this sort of thing in terms of, you know, it, I, I might have, dad is perfectly willing to help with math, but he doesn't want dad to help with math. He wants mom to help with math. And that's, it's, so there's sometimes these polls that are, I don't know what the solution is, but it's very real, I think. Um, this idea of you may have um, a spouse or a partner who's very much wanting to take half the child care, but sometimes whatever a, a child needs at that given moment, it the, the parent that they want it from may not be available at that moment. And so that's kind of a, a, a shift, I think, for kids because they're not used to being home when mom and dad are working, right? They're used to when everybody's home, that's family time. And so it, it's, it's tricky because there are, even when you have, you know, both partners totally committed to sharing childcare burden, there sometimes is still a, a, a challenge to that. Yeah, great points, everyone. Um, so I'm going to switch gears a little bit. This is a question that combines um, a few of the different Q&A questions we've gotten. Uh, so how do we, can you support or can we support as a society high school students who are interested in the science and medicine or other um, science type fields that you're all in? And what advice would you give your younger self to be successful in the challenging path to a career in science or medicine? So anybody, this is for anybody who wants to jump in. I, I think that um, we should more openly promote internship and opportunities for people to come into companies or academic research labs. Even as late as when I was in graduate school and a postdoc, it was very unclear to me the breadth and options of sort of science-based careers within industry. I made a decision during my postdoctoral career that I wanted to go into industry. And I thought that the trajectory would be, I would go, I'd work as a research scientist, which I did. I was hired by IDEX, came to Maine because of the job, no other reason, no connection to Maine. I wanted to go where I, for a job that I wanted. And there was introduced to sort of a management track and then thought, okay, I can see myself progressing and managing a lab, a, a group of people in a lab, a small group of people in a lab. What I ended up doing is still pretty different from that. And, and now within my company and with, within other companies, there are product managers, there are business unit heads, there are technical service people, there are application scientists, there's this breadth of science-based industrial careers just within a company that I think is hard, hard to see um, and not necessarily talked about openly. I mean, maybe it's changed somewhat, but when I was a postdoc and my advisor found out that I was interviewing at companies and wanted to be industrial scientist, he basically didn't speak to me for two weeks and just said, oh, you've sold yourself out. Mm -hmm. I feel like that's changed. Yeah, I think changed. Yeah. I think it's changed because yeah. I think academic jobs are not like it's not possible for every single person who's getting a, a master's or a PhD to then go and be an academic mm -hmm. scientist. And that was just not what I wanted to do. And um, but but even still, it, I think it's very hard to see and know what those are without having some experience. Um, and it's hard when you're in a company and when, when I've led labs, 
the whole conversation about taking on an intern and all like, okay, this person's going to be here for two months, maybe three, and it's going to take a lot of training time and it's going to slow everything down and I'm not going to hit my deadlines. It's a big decision to take on someone, an untrained person to come into your lab. So I'm very interested in what more we can do to promote those kinds of opportunities for high school col and college students um, in particular. Great. Lauren, you want to add to that as a, a career expert? Yeah, well, so I was going to say a number of groups are starting to create more videos about life in the life as a scientist, life as a medical affairs person, life as a clinical researcher, because there are life in finance in a life sciences company. Like, I think it's important. You raise a good point, Janet, about we need to make people aware of all the various ways you can use a science background across many functional areas. And so like New York Academy of Sciences, Mass Bio is going to be doing some videos to make it easier. So I think we need to try to promote these to the high school students, the guidance counselors and other folks to make people aware. Uh, and that way they can try to seek out resources and seek out guidance. Right, Jen? Um, I, it's an interesting discussion because I think um, I look at it a little bit differently in that one way to view the, uh, this really connected, I guess, with what Janet was saying about academic people like kind of not, not, you know, looking, being dismissive of industry. I say to people that are solely academic, you're not solving problems that scale to change the world. And that, I came from like, I was at Hopkins and I was at Penn, like I've done the NIH path. I may very well end up back on it. But what I saw is that it wasn't the lens for solving the problems I was seeing every day in the clinic, and that's okay. Um, I think what we also know in this discussion is um, that as, as funding shifts more to companies and away from NIH, that's the place that we're going to have to do more training. It's going to be in companies. So the way I have viewed this um, is we're now realizing if everyone's working remotely, it's actually our duty to probably find a way to take on some learners for remote work. And I view this, uh, the way I've done this in the last just month is viewed this through the lens of the Black Lives Matter movement. I said to myself, what can I do this summer that matters? So what I did was call the place that I went to college and said, are there students there who, whose internships fell through? Somebody I can take on. And I have ended up with a remarkable junior from Raleigh, North Carolina. And I said, Gabby, the maternal mortality rate is five times uh, what it is in white moms, in black moms. So I need you to work on this problem. And she has gone nuts. So if you find the right match, She's learning a ton, I'm learning a ton, and Lauren, you could probably say more about this, but it is incredibly important that somebody takes an interest in you at a critical time in your life. Mm -hmm. And whether they're in your lab or it's a phone call once a week, I think we can have a disproportionate impact. So for me, I didn't want her to fall off and have a gap in her resume, right? Mm -hmm. Because part of the reason to be an undergrad at Harvard is the connections that you make. She's missing, she's gonna miss a big chunk of the value. So as an alum, I was saying, how can I replace that? So that, that's one way to think about it. And Jen, we have a question, and it's related to what you were just saying, and it's addressed to you, so I'm just going to go with it yeah. right now. Um, and maybe you'll say health disparities here, because I think that's coming up a lot right now. But um, someone was asking how the innovation cohort works that you work with, and what do you think is the next big thing uh, needed in healthcare innovation? Yeah, uh, so the, I'll say briefly how we work is uh, this was set up under the um, kind of uh, every time you come into a big organization, you need some sort of sponsor, right? Because I show up like 35 years old saying, this is what I think we need. And you get blank stares if you don't go in with a champion. So I had kind of lined that up before I came through our chief and um, lined up a little bit of money to start a group and just was very humble about it. And now we run two groups a year. And to apply, it's five questions, right? The first is, what is your name? The second is, what's your email? The third is, what is the clinical discomfort that's causing you to uh, apply? The fourth is, how would a little bit of money get you some early runway? And the fifth was, do you have any additional questions for me? That's an application that invites participation, which I would say is the opposite of an NIH-type structure. I think we also need to do research that seeks to improve, not necessarily prove. It's just a, and I learned all this by hustle. I didn't learn this at med school or fellowship. It was having a need that wasn't being solved by traditional methods that made me think like that. So right now, anybody who works at Maine Health can apply, and we welcome that. We'll open again for the cohort process in the, right after Labor Day. But I looked for it to be the flattest room in the hospital and to be from all levels of the organization. 
Um, so we have social workers, we have medical students. Um, we had a physical therapist come down from Penn Bay because we had a good idea. Um, so what, the, what is the future of this? I think the future of healthcare is more people who tell the truth and take risks. So what I would tell, and sometimes we don't allow for that experimentation under the auspices of patient safety. Patient safety is a wonderful thing, but we need a few more truth tellers running small experiments and then at scale because we're in a real bind. Thank you. Uh, this question is for any of you, and this was from the Q&A box. How do we bring more startup and established biopharma to Maine? So how do we grow that sector of Maine's economy? Well, at the risk of, um, at, at the risk of being, speaking out of turn, one of the things that impresses me about Maine is that for what is largely a rural state, the biotech sector is actually pretty impressive. Um, just as a, as an observation, because there's IDEX and JAX and, and, um, you know, it, uh, a layer, Abbott. And, Abbott, and yeah, it, it's um, it it's actually to me, it's it's it it's Maine is in a way punching above its weight class in terms of biotech. But that being said, always more is better. So, I I would add that I think about this through the lens of what clinical problems are unsolved, and then try to start from there. And then also think about what assets are already here and somewhat develop that we can probably um, build towards kind of value-added products from what's there. And I talk about that a lot when we talk about the biomedical assets of the ocean. It's a very sexy thing to talk about. I love when people ask me about it. Um, and one thing we're looking at that I, maybe Janet can help us with is trying to figure out if we should be uh, producing alginates at scale from kelp with the right uh, G content. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's the, the learning point here is the most interesting work happens at the intersections of fields, and you need to find within your job a place that has some runway and tolerance for that. And I think that can be hard in big organizations. But that, to me, is the future of kind of homegrown biomedical relevance. It's, it's across fields and then naturally spinning out of places like Jack's and landing a new company two miles down the road. Yeah, it's an interesting question and one that um... – I was involved in in a long time for a long time. Um, I think what you have both said is exactly true. We need to build on the assets that are here and not try to build something out of nothing. In order to do that, you have to take politics out of the conversation. It can't be focused on geographies on Ma in Maine. It can't be focused on a particular organization or another because of political will. But, you know, and Maine Bio has done some very good assessments along with the state of what are the assets and what are the areas that can be grown. Because we, ha we don't have a, a tier one medical school in the state. And that's one of the factors, not the only, of, of most places where you grow a lot of biotech. But there are other assets that we have. We have the equivalent of tier one research in our nonprofit research labs, MMCRI, if that's still their name, and JAX, um, you know, sort of leading, leading that pack, some marine organizations as well. Um, and, it, and you combine those, for example, with the university. So something that I worked on when I was in the state, it was that the PhD degree that you get by doing your work like in a lab at MMCRI and you're awarded a PhD from UMaine, you know, so to allow these kind of collaborative efforts to work in a, in a you know, a way that's maybe not like Boston. We're not going to become Boston. We don't have the critical mass. We're not going to become RTP. We're not going to become San Diego. There are lots of models out there, but it's very hard to find models with the dispersed population that we have and large geography. So some of those answers have to be specific, but they do have to build on the assets that are here. There is an asset that we're close to New Hampshire and Boston. And a lot of economic development groups have focused on, oh, we're going to pull people up. People just don't want to drive in Boston, so they're going to establish this company in Maine. And they want to know who they're going to hire. Where's the workforce going to come from? Where's the trained workforce going to come from? So the educational institutions 
And it's not like you're going to attract PhDs from all over, right? But how are you, who are you going to hire to be your line workers? Who are you going to hire to run those machines that Abbott runs, that IDEX runs? So th there's a lot about workforce development in those in those efforts as well. And it's hard <laughs> to have all those groups in the same room working together and remaining aligned on the goal. Um, but I do think that we've made a lot of progress and that it's it's an interesting environment. I could go on, right? Because I worked in this field for a long time, but um, yeah, it's interesting. <laughs> Great. I'm going to try and get us, uh, we've got about 12 minutes. We have three really good questions. I'm going to try and get us through these three before we move to the open, um, open Q&A session where we can see everybody. Uh, Lauren, one of them was for you. I'm sort of combining two questions. Um, if you can talk a little about, bit about the process when you work with your clients and also uh, a question we got about pros and cons choosing a master's versus a PhD um, in some of these bioscience fields. Yeah, great, uh, great questions. Okay, so, so in terms of myself, I, I have the pleasure of kind of being on both sides of the uh, career I guess, guidance side of helping individuals think about where they fit and what are their strengths and, and how do they really think about their path uh, for their careers in life sciences. And then I also engage with companies to help them hire people. And so it's, it's nice to be at both ends because I get to see the, uh, the good things and the things that could be optimized, both in the talent seeking and the talent, I guess, obtaining. End. And so if anyone's interested in talking more with me about whether it's helping companies hire or helping people find opportunities, reach out to me. I'll make sure that my email is shared with, uh, with all of you. Um, in terms of the, can, can you repeat the second part of that question again? Yes, yeah, so choosing between a master's or a PhD if you're going into a bioscience field. Yeah, well, so this is a hard one. Okay, so because, it, okay, uh, I guess I would say for, for folks, I mean, both can be really valuable because with both degrees, you can have significant impact in terms of research activities that, is, that are happening. Um, you know, I think part of it might be what, what drives people, uh, you know, and thinking about, I guess, the master side, um, you know, sometimes people uh, with master's backgrounds might be even closer to the science for a longer period of time, but I've seen that be a stepping stone to getting into regulatory or clinical or marketing or business development or field application specialist. You know, similar with the PhD, it also opens up a lot of doors that people, that people have. I, I would probably suggest not to focus as much on degree, but more on like area of focus or area of study and, and making sure that you're passionate about it. Because I, because I, I would also say that if you talk to most people that are advanced in their career, they may have studied something, but they end up, they end up branching out into so many other areas. And so that, that degree is like a stepping stone. But once you're in, that's your opportunity to really, you know, take initiative, really grow, really seek mentors. Like we were talking about that a little bit, you know, finding people that can really help shape your career so you're really proactive about how that develops over time. So I know I didn't really answer the question. It's not always like a yes or no, but, but uh, you know, feel free, those of you that are thinking about this, again, I'll share my info and I'm happy to talk more about that. And uh, Agnieszka did put your email in the chat, so you might get Excellent. flooded with emails now. Jen, go ahead. One thing I want to add to that, it's really important, I think also to kind of know yourself a little bit as you go into it because when you look at who's leading organizations maybe 10 or 15 years down the road they don't tend to be very deep channel experts so i'll give you an example i'm a general cardiologist there are people that sub sub specialize beyond that but depending on what you really want to spend your time doing that may not be the way to go now you can struggle in a group with that because you feel like there's always somebody who who has like a deeper ac academic expertise in that. And that may be true, but what do you want to spend your life doing? So that, the big trouble, I think, in academic medicine is you kind of keep chasing the carrot. So try mm -hmm. to know who you are. I think a master's with, you know, potentially a joint master's MBA is a fantastic way to go, unless you really mm -hmm. want to compete for your own lab. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, okay, this question we get every year, various versions of it. We've gotten various versions of it in the Q&A box. Um, so what are some strategies you've learned that help women achieve more prominent roles in their organizations and has being a woman in bioscience affected your career? So anybody who wants to start us off? I'll Megan? start. Yes, it has. Um, I, I don't know. I, I don't know how to say it any plainer than that. It absolutely has. Um, 
and you know, I mean, and there's there's a perception of of academia as an old boys club, and perceptions exist for a reason, frankly. Um, one of the strategies that um, that a lot of my colleagues and I have developed is that we reinforce each other always and we don't tear into each other we reinforce each other so if we're in a faculty meeting and i think um you know there's some version of a of a joke in here but this has absolutely happened several times i've witnessed it where somebody a a, a woman might have an idea might say something and then say, okay yeah yeah we'll think about that two minutes later two rows down so a, a tall dude says the exact same thing and everyone's like brilliant yes oh this that's gonna solve everything and you think i literally just said that and um so what a lot of us have have started doing is each time a suggestion is made and a, an objective person can see, yes, that would be a very helpful strategy, another of us will raise our hand as Tamara just said, blah, 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 blah. And then next comment later, as Karen just pointed out, blah, 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 blah. So the, I think we don't help each other by pretending that this doesn't exist. It does. It absolutely does. And these are unconscious biases in many cases that um, sometimes they're overt and totally conscious, but there are, there are real unconscious biases that we have to overcome. But reinforcing, you know, so there's now been repeated three times whose idea that actually was, um, that that can actually be quite helpful. And another piece that, um, is a is a physical thing that I've absolutely dealt with is I'm five feet tall and I'm overtly female looking I have a high pitched voice. So there are again unconscious triggers to that that I can't control. But what I can control is doing things like if I'm saying something in a meeting, a lot of times I will stand up and start talking so that the, a, a physical cue of mine is I can't be taller than I am, but I can simulate that I'm taller than I am. And this seems like nonsense that we shouldn't have to put up with, and it is, but that's not the reality we live in right at this particular moment. So sometimes these little small things can go a long way toward establishing your own persona and once it's established you don't really have to do it anymore but um it, it's really important that you create this perception that you know that that takes your gender out of it more or less and um and then i think the other piece that's really valuable and as much as we all talk about you have to be firm and you have to say no to things and you have to blah, 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 blah. Again, true. But the reality we still live in is that you saying no and your total, you know, matched male control saying, no, I'm not doing that is still perceived very differently. And so one of the other pieces is that you can say no to things in charming ways and you shouldn't have to do that, but it is helpful. <laughs> Lauren? Yeah, I was going to say, uh, I mean, certainly like seek mentors. If you're thinking about a certain career path or career area or skills you want to learn, try to seek out people proactively that maybe you don't call them your formal mentors because people get nervous sometimes by that title, but you can find people that you can seek advice from and let people know what you're thinking. So many people, especially women, just put their head down, work really hard, and they assume people will know that they want to get promoted or that they want this other opportunity, but it, people have to feel comfortable speaking up and letting people, I, I always say empower people to help you 
gain whatever it is that you're looking for. Because if you don't do that, people can't read your mind. They've got a lot of things going on and, uh, and such. Yeah, I was just going to chime in to uh, reiterate what Megan and Lauren have both said, um, because when I wrote down, this was, you know, a question we had thought about, and what I wrote down was, one, speak up. I've had, you know, the experience of sometimes women are not the ones speaking up, and sometimes they get talked over by the men, but often in my observation, the men who are talking over women are basically talking over everyone. So it's the ability to, to speak up in that environment. And, and some of this, and some of what I did as I moved out of the lab and moved more into management positions that I think is really helpful and sometimes overlooked is taking advantage of training. I did management training. I did communication styles training. I did how to deal with conflict. I'm probably gonna do another one of those soon because I haven't done it in a long time. But these, you know, there are, sort of generalizations to speak to what um, you know Megan was saying that that actually they sometimes they come more naturally to some personalities than others or to men than to women and sometimes you can pick up those little tips and tricks from these little seminars and trainings that you can do and I think sometimes it gets overlooked because you think you know how to do it or it's kind of silly or you don't have time and I certainly benefited you know quite a lot from those kinds of things in, in being able to interact with people. And then the other thing I'm working on for myself is to check those inherent biases, because I do believe that they exist and the data would show from, you know, blind experiments you do with two different names on the same resume, that women hold those inherent biases at the same levels that men do. And so again, I think that's some work that we can do as we advance in our careers and are in places where we are hiring people, recommending people for raises and promotions is to really look hard at that and make sure that we're not, um, we're not living out our inherent biases ourselves. That's great. And that actually leads us right into the next question, which we don't have time for here. So I'm going to ask this question when we